It is a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Stephanie Weeder. As she makes her way up, I'll let you know Dr. Weeder grew up in Tanana, Rampart, and Glena villages and is a member of the Huslia village tribe. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences and a Master of Education and Secondary Education from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She later received her medical doctorate from the University of Washington School of Medicine. Between 2018 and 2021, Dr. Weeder was the Alaska representative for the Alliance for Equal Representation in Medicine. In this role, she mentored current and future applicants on the admission requirements and application process for medical school. She worked one-on-one -on -one with four successfully admitted underrepresented in medicine applicants throughout each step of the application process. As one of 13 University of Washington Department of Emergency Medic Medicine interns, Dr. Weeder is beginning her postgraduate training this summer. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Weeder as our keynote address. Y'all can keep me on time. I am have this weird concept of time. I've learned um, being in code situations as a doctor that one minute can feel super long. <laughs> so 20 minutes may fly by, who knows. Um, so Dointa Neslatnio Uza. I'll switch over to English because my, I may introduce myself a little bit uh, traditionally and my family history is a little too complex for my level of Danaga fluency. <laughs> um, so my name is Stephanie Weeder. I am um, blessed. Um, you know the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. I am blessed with many parents, um, which helped me get to where I am today. Um, so my mother is Mary Moses Edwin, um, and my uh, stepdad of the late Dennis Edwin. Uh, my dad is Arnold Mark, um, and my stepmom, Danette. And then my fun dad is uh, Milton Moses Jr., <laughs> who uh, Throughout my uh, childhood, cruised me all over Alaska on his snow machine. Uh, so I met some people um, through those journeys. Um, I also just realized that I wrote something down to keep myself on track, so I better look at that as well. Um, I am a Husli Village tribal member. Um, I am the granddaughter of the late Laura Ambrose Mark and Peter Mark, um, as well as John and Lula Wallace, um, and so that side of my family is Mescalero Apache, um, and then my dad's uh, Koyakan Athabascan. I have, uh, I've been blessed with siblings as well, um, so I am one of 11 children. Um, my brothers are Milton Moses, uh, the late Lawrence Moses, Archie Agnes, Aaron Mark, Arnold Marks, Andrew Marks, Grace Marks, Elise Marks, my uh, former foster son, uh, now brother, Troy Edwin, and uh, then my stepbrother, Jerry Edwin. Um, I am married to Eric Weeder of Huslia, and we have three children, Angelica, who is 21 and in college, not dating myself. I had her as a teenager. I got pregnant as a teenager, just saying. <laughs> um, and then uh, my boys, um, one of which is my son, Blaze, hiding out in the corner over there. Um, he likes to hide out, as do I. Uh, and then my youngest is my son, Flint, who is in fifth grade. Um, I grew up in the villages starting off as a baby. Uh, the village of Dot Lake is where I, my family was living when I was born. Um, so my godparents are the late chief Andrew Isaac and his wife Maggie. Um, and then uh, my youngest brother was born, uh, not my youngest, my brother Arnold. I should say he's older because he just announced turning 40, so he's got to be older than me. Um, but my brother Arnold was uh, born in Kotzebue uh, about six weeks early. Uh, I'm glad I was not the doctor on call when that happened. Um, and then uh, I remember living in Husli a little bit as a toddler, um, just mainly being jealous coming from spring camp where my family's house is near um, and my family and we're all walking to like the main part of Husli. And I was so jealous of my brother Junior or Arnold being carried on my dad's back while I had to walk with my little legs. We're only like 14 months apart. I mean, <laughs> anyway. Um, 
and then uh, elementary between McGrath and Holy Cross, um, and then lived in Rampart uh, in the summers through when I was 12 through 18. Uh, my late brother Lawrence started sending me to Rampart, and I had to hang out with my brother Melton, um, and then Auntie George. Um, and then uh, Tanana, oh, I skipped Alakakit. I lived in Alakakit during seventh grade, uh, moved away when it flooded, uh, and then moved to Tanana, uh, and then graduated from Galena. Um, I've lived in rural Alaska my entire life. I only uh, moved out of villages uh, for um, school. So my bachelor's degree, um, my master's degree a little bit, and then now my doctorate in residency. Um, we went over my education a little bit earlier. We'll talk more about my journey in a moment. Um, but I will say I'm pretty humbled to be asked to speak here. I'm sitting here hanging out with all these tribal leaders, right? Chiefs, elders, um, lawyers, CEOs, presidents. And I'm just like a resident who, if you all knew some parts of my job, you'd be like, what is she doing here? <laughs> um, but nothing is uh, too little or too much. Um, so in the topic today, celebrating the success of our people is such a huge topic. Uh, and I'm honored that I can be one to speak on it when there's so many successful people in this room right now. I, um, you know, ever since I was uh, in high school, I started carrying a dictionary around because, you know, it, not dating myself, but internet wasn't really a thing until about my senior year of high school. Um, and so I'd carry a dictionary around because I didn't know words that I was reading and coming across all the time. My brother Arnold talks, he's an English teacher, English major, a little different path in life. That stuff's a little um, boring in my perspective. Um, but uh, he talks about how my mom would speak 500 words of English over the breakfast table. Um, and I don't know where he was hearing that English, because I was carrying a dictionary and looking up words that I was coming across. Like, I remember com my mom um, helping edit a paper, and she writes in the word paradoxical. And I'm like, what does that mean? And I'm looking it up. And I mean, that's how I learned, right? I did the same thing with this. So what does success mean? I wanted to see what, I know what it means to me. I think it's a pretty personal definition. I wanted to see what the dictionary says. So I went to my number one source, not really, because I can go online and edit it. But Wikipedia says it's the opposite of failure. <laughs> Good job. It's always nice to know the extremes. Um, and then looking at the Oxford Dictionary, uh, it says it's the accomplishment of an aim or a purpose. So everyone who's alive today has accomplished things. Everyone is successful. Um, and for me, uh, I, would, I would just like sum it up because I always do, and I do this a lot as a doctor too, uh, and it might drive some of my doctor colleagues a little nuts because sometimes they want doctor speak and then I'll just like say things. Um, but it's having a goal, sticking to it, achieving it. Um, and then I can take it even further. And to me, um, I, my base, my definition on when I had, as when I was a teacher in Galena, and I had a guest speaker coming out, she was a PhD um, student in psychiatry, and she loved her job. And I'm sitting over on the corner at the desk, and she's talking about um, how she wakes up every morning as a, a psychiatry student, and she's like super excited, and she's loving life. And I was there as a teacher and probably didn't sleep very much the night before. I, I sleep even less now as a doctor. And I remember thinking, I want that. You know, I wanted to teach and knowing I wasn't going to do it forever. Um, and we'll talk a little about that in a second. But I just remember having that feeling and hearing her talk, and I felt energized. So to me, my new definition of success is being happy, doing what I love while helping others. That's my goal, and that's my um, version of success. I love being an emergency medicine doctor, and I'm not fully there yet. I'm a doctor, um, but when we graduate medical school, we're just kind of like generalized knowledge. Like, yeah, I know about the body. I know you can name a random medication, and I can tell you exactly what like protein, enzyme, whatever that it works on in the body. Um, but as a resident, I really learn all the aspects. Like in medical school, I may have learned how to place a chest tube on a mannequin. In residency, I'm actually doing it, right? Um, those are things emergency medicine doctors do. Um, so I'm a doctor, but I'm still mastering emergency medicine, and I'm learning all the time. Um, very humbling experience. So um, and if I have time, I'll go on to a little caveat about that, which is why I told my son to come here, even though his hair is sticking up. Um, <laughs> I can't blame him. I forgot my hairbrush. 
I, that's how, that's my level. I was so happy last night because as a resident, sometimes I work six to eight shifts in a row and they can be 12 to 14 hours. And I've definitely done like 26, 27 hour shifts, um, not in the emergency department. Those are typically on critical care. Um, and so it's nice to have a break and it's nice to sleep. So like last night I was telling one of my friends over there, it's like, yeah, I got to shave my legs last night. <laughs> <laughs> New definition of success. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I also got to sleep in past 4.30 a.m. today. That was really lovely. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey to where I, how I got here. And like I said, feel free to give me a minute whatever warning. Um, but uh, my road to success wasn't smooth. I didn't just like, you know, I, have, I definitely have a classmate. I think my youngest classmate for the entering class of 2018, which is when I started medical school, was 22 years old. She went from high school to undergraduate to medical school, no gap year in between. I didn't do that pathway, right? I taught for 12 years. Um, and so, um, and, and I can't say I didn't want to go into medicine. Um, I was interested in medicine from the start as a, as, as a toddler, right? As a toddler, just being curious about the world because that's what science is. It's being curious about the world, um, wondering what things do and answering them. And also in our native culture with our way of learning, um, at least for me growing up, you don't like sit there asking questions and expecting to be how, be told how to do things. Like I remember um, my dad when he was, in, who I awesomely see in the crowd, um, was, uh, would be like changing the oil on a three-wheeler and he'd just be talking through the steps as he does it and me and my brothers are just playing in the background. But that's like a way of teaching and a way of learning. Um, it's also the way I learned how to drive a car, but the girls' basketball team I drove back from Toke will never know that. They were women. I was a kid. Um, anyway, um, so um, I'll talk about a little bit about the bumps in the road that I hit. Um, and like I said, I get off topic, so I'm trying to stay on. Um, and talk about maybe why not everyone chooses this path. Um, so, and also kind of the person that we're, one of the people that we're focusing on, focusing on with this meeting is Walter Harper. Um, this conference is in honor of him. He is also from the community of Tanana. He lived from 1893 to 1918. I have no clue how they, how they research those dates because I don't even know what year my dad was born uh, because they recorded it wrong, being born in, you know, the middle of the woods. Um, anyway, um, one of the reasons why I'm bringing him up, other than he was an amazing person, the first to summit Denali in 1913, um, was because one of his goals in life was to go to medical school. And this is like, you know, 1918s when he passed away. This is way back in the day. Um, and he wanted to become a medical missionary, which I find crazy. Um, so part of our medical school education is learning about the history of medicine and the history of medic medical education. Through that, I learned that the first black doctor was um, graduated medical school in 1837. He was named James McCune Smith. I know that's not Native American, it's black, but it's a minority. And what I remember from my medical school lectures on this is that, that, per that, that there was segregation back then, meaning that you'd have all the non-minority uh, medical school students kind of sitting in rows, and then way off in the corner, there's a little lone desk, and there's a one, uh, emerging doctor, Dr. Smith. I could not, I, my, my, my child, medical school is challenging. I could not imagine being that person. The first Native American doctor was Susan Luflesh Picote, um, who graduated from Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1889. It's just mind blowing. There's not a lot of medical, um, Native American medical doctors. In 2018, which is the year that I ex got accepted into medical school, only 0.3% of active US doctors in the US were Native American. Uh, in 2015, 18,000 medical school grads, out of 18,000 medical school grads in the year of 2015, only 20 were Native American. This has not improved, and it may seem like it because I'm standing before you, and some, as chances are some of you know other people who are currently in medical school um, because I definitely know, well, I mentor people, so I definitely know people, uh, Native Alaska Natives who are in medical school right now. Um, but uh, in the past uh, couple of years, the amount of American Indian and Alaska Native people going into medical school dropped from 0.4%, like getting accepted, to 0.2%. And last year specifically, the amount of people who entered into medical school dropped by 9% of the low amount it already was. So it's not an easy field to get into. Um, and 
on top of that, it's not an easy process. Um, they challenge you every step of the way, even getting into this medical school, but they, but it just gets harder in the sense that, oh, we have to take the MCAT, medical college admissions test, to even apply to medical school. That's like a three and a half hour test, I think. I can't really remember. Step one is six hours. Step two is seven and a half hours. These are medical licensing exams. Every US doctor passes them. Step three is a two-day exam. I'm taking step three sometime this coming year. It's the one where it's like if I wanted to quit residency and just practice as a general doctor, I could. Um, but I don't want to quit residency. I really love emergency medicine. Um, all right, so, uh, and in my class alone, for the class of Alaska Whammy, there were 20 people who got accepted into medical school, only 15 of us graduated on time. A couple dropped out and a couple expanded. Uh, so it's a challenging process, but I'm happy that I was able to stay on track. Um, my path into medical school was not smooth. I'm definitely not a perfect person. Um, I mean, I like to pick on my brother, Junior, mainly because my bro I grew up with my competitive nature, right? Growing up alongside six of my brothers, I always wanted to be the fastest skier. I always wanted to be the fastest runner. Um, and they, they would copy me all the time. I buy a new truck as an adult, they buy the same exact truck. I buy a new snow machine, they buy the same snow machine. I'm getting behind now because I've been a broke medical student. <laughs> Something failed here because my brother Arnold was a guest speaker before I was. So, I'm just, <laughs> it's all, so I'll keep picking on him. <laughs> uh, so um, when I first started picking on him, he was in diapers um, because, and this is just me pointing out that I'm not perfect, uh, because we're living in this little red house in the street of McGrath and I was in preschool. I have very early memories. Um, like I retained pretty early memories in life. Uh, and so I remember like finding a lighter. I was like, yeah, this is cool. You know, I'm just, a t I'm, I'm in preschool, I'm a little kid. And I remember making him take off his diaper and lay it on the floor of a bathroom and I lit it on fire. And then I freaked out and ran to the bedroom and it's like, there's something on fire in the bathroom. And then I proceeded to fall asleep really quickly and let my parents deal with it. Um, anyway, so I'm not perfect. I've done other little mischievous things throughout my life, but I'm here. Um, <laughs> meaning that everyone else doesn't have to be perfect. I don't believe there's a perfect person out there. Um, so, um, Kind of wondering why more people don't go this path or go other pathways that are successful. There's a lot of things that can help hold people back. Literature for a Native American, I focus on doctors specifically because that's the path I went, but literature focuses on Native American doctors. Things that are keeping people back from um, going this path is low socioeconomic status, uh, multiple struggles that are associated with that, and uh, cultural barriers. Um, no one ever talks about IQ. I would definitely say Natives are not stupid. Um, I have definitely questioned my own intelligence multiple times, especially as a doctor, because I'm surrounded by super smart people. I will say um, that one of the things that's kind of helped me in life, well, numerous times is my mom, Mary Edwin, because she uh, has a ton of degrees. Um, started off as a bachelor's in aeronautical engineering, got an EDS, which is like the doctorate, PhD kind of version of an educational degree. Um, but she was a special education lawyer coordinator in McGrath when I was in preschool and identified pretty early on that I should be tested for gifted and talented, and they did. And I didn't really know what that meant. I mean, it meant that I got to go like hang out and do stained glass or go learn to play piano or things like that growing up. Um, I didn't know until uh, I got a little bit older that, oh, my friends receive help from their parents when they're doing homework, because that's not something that I did. Um, and so, even when I got to college as an undergrad, I was sitting in my second semester of freshman biology and I got a C on my first semester. So yeah, I'm a doctor who once got a C. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> I was sitting in freshman biology, second semester, biology 106 at UAF. And I was surrounded by all these people and like not really thinking um, a whole lot by it going, showing up for the final exam. And the professor, and this is second semester, the professor looks at me as I'm walking through the door and he's like, hey, what are you doing, Stephanie? And I'm like, holy cow, he knows my name. I was so happy to hide out in a classroom of like over 100 people. Um, and I was like, well, thinking he's joking. I'm like, well, I'm here to take the final. <laughs> and he tells me, oh, uh, do you just want to take it? Because it will affect your grade. And I'm like, well, I need to. And he's like, you didn't get my email? And basically, I had a high enough grade that he excused me from the final. And that was shocking going from a C to like not even having to sit for a final in one school year. Um, so. That was also a very humbling experience because, you know, I struggled the first semester of biology. I struggled how, learning how to read academic science uh, verbiage. 
um, and definitely had a dictionary by me the entire time. I also just struggled my first semester in college learning how to live in a city, learning how to eat uh, non-native foods because my stomach was so upset the first semester of college. Um, anyway, uh, so I will say uh, that my biggest barrier to doing anything in life has all been my own mental barriers. So I had the uh, thought, you know, I was interested in becoming a doctor early on. As a high school student, uh, my graduation project, because I graduated from Project Education Register, Dental school, which later became Gila, we at that time when I was a senior in it, we had to do projects. So I wrote a 40 to 60 page paper on traditional medicine of the Koyukon Athabascans, um, cited a lot of other Alaska Native traditional medicine type of literature that was out there at the time, interviewed the late Angela Huntington, um, and just like, you know, it was a great project, but that was very clearly I was interested in medicine. I remember as a senior in high school seeing a poster on the wall for Delakeets. Delakeets is a program designed to attract people from rural Alaska into medicine. It's kind of held, holds hands with the Alaska Whammy Medical School. I remember looking at it, not even applying to it because I didn't think I had a shot. It's pretty crazy now. Um, so I had to come over my own mental barrier and what helped me really do that in life other than like living life um, was moving to Galena for my second teaching job. I moved to Galena to teach after teaching in Tanana for six years and met Dr. Huntington and kind of getting to know her and she's the first doctor I ever really got to know um, because aside from that I would just go in and get my hips checked out every now and then throughout my life because I was a frank breach uh, which means I was born uh, backwards <laughs> um, and so my hips weren't quite perfect. Anyway, but I was still a UAF runner, so you know, didn't hold me back too much in life. Um, but uh, so I, I saw doctors throughout my life, but I didn't really ever get to know them, never thought of them as normal people. Just getting to know a doctor got me to realize, holy cow, she's a woman, she has kids, because I had kids by then, um, and she did it. And you know, and and she's like a normal person. Like we did a lot of the same things. We both lifeguarded, lifeguarded at the pool. Um, I would volunteer nights and weekends in the clinic and Glena as an EMT. And she would also come over to my classroom and speak to the students. So getting to know a doctor and realizing that they're normal people made me realize, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. Um, so she's like been a huge impact in my life. Um, and then at the same time, um, I was still too shy to tell anyone what I was doing. I didn't tell her that I was pursuing medicine until I already uh, resigned from my position as a teacher. Like, I was working alongside her, but I didn't tell her, hey, I want to be a doctor. Um, I just kind of did it. And because I didn't take any mentors and didn't really know a lot of people, I literally learned how to do the process through listening to a podcast while walking laps around Galena, um, like, for exercise. Anyway. Um, so sometimes you don't get things handed to you in life. Sometimes you just got to kind of make your own way. Uh, I was approached by the, when I was teaching Glean, I was approached by the University of Alaska Fairbanks and asked if I would teach for them um, in the sense of offering, starting a health science track in Galena, offering dual credit, high school, college credit courses. Um, as part of that process, I started traveling students around, the uh, around Alaska um, and like going and checking out Fairbanks Memorial Hospital, going and competing in competitions like HOSA, which is like CPR competitions, things like that. We went to a pre-med summit um, where I got to hear Dr. Nora Nagarak speak. Nora Nagarak is from Unilakleet, Alaska. Um, she is a primary care physician, and she is Native American, right? She's a Nupiak from Unilakleet. Um, she talked about her journey to medicine and how she felt like she was never smart enough and never good enough, and I was just like, holy cow, that is me. Um, so sometimes you never know what impact someone will have um, on a person's life until you're the one being impacted by it. Um, all right, so uh, I will say um, I never expected that I'd actually, I never knew when I was applying to medical school that it would be a success in the sense that I applied to 20 medical schools because that podcast I was listening to when I was walking loops around Galena um, after teaching for a full day, uh, talked about how many people fail at getting into medical school. So I applied to 20 medical schools. I was offered 14 interviews. Um, and to put things in perspective, 100, like for um, 20 seats out of medical school, maybe 1,000 people apply, maybe 100 or 150 get interviewed, and then they accept 20 or whatever their class size is. So it's like a very um, humbling process. Every time I was at an interview, everyone around me was super amazing, and I'm like, holy cow, how am I ever going to stand out? Um, so uh, I 
got offered 14 interviews. I accepted 12 of my interviews, received seven acceptances. I was sitting in um, the University of Colorado School of Medicine on an interview day when I got my acceptances, and they all came at once, and it was like, holy cow, I'm going to be a doctor. Very amazing. Um, I also was waitlisted at a few places. <laughs> I will say um, that the medical school process was hard, um, and the whole process along the way is hard. Residency is not that easy either. Um, but the fact that I lived a lot of life before this, the fact that I stumbled um, in life a bit, uh, helped me. I have. I had a patient um, kind of fairly recently in one of the ICUs because emergency medicine doctors also staff ICUs, um, and that's a big part of our training um, because we have, you know, emergency medicine doctors are there for at least the first hour usually of patient stabilization on super sick patients. Um, so I was in an ICU and I had this patient who we luckily didn't have to intubate overnight, although I personally love to intubate people. Just, it's not, not always in the best interest of the patient. Um, but. Uh, this patient grew, was telling his story to me the next day, and he was talking about how golden of a life he had, how golden of a childhood he had. And then, and he was um, in our ICU because he had overdosed on drugs, and like we were worried that we're gonna have to intubate him and keep him breathing and all this stuff. And this is a very common thing because I work at one of the hospitals I work at, it's a county hospital, um, meaning that like everyone walks through the doors. Um, and he told me basically, that when his life started to change was when his parent got a really terminal diagnosis. And that was that, because he had never really had stumbling blocks in life, getting something big on him just totally, he couldn't handle it. And I think about this. I think about this all the time because for me, I had challenges thrown at me all the time. I mean, I've lived through three major floods, like, um, like I was in Alakakit when there's houses floating by <laughs> as we're like being helicoptered out. Um, I've lived through two house fires, um, one as a kid when my house was like completely down to the foundation. Um, and, uh, you know, being married to, um, I, I've been divorced before. I talk about failure all the time. Um, but I'm also currently married and just like dealing with people close to me who are struggling with alcoholism and substance use, which also helps me with my patients now because I know that people can change and people can turn their lives around. My late stepdad, Dennis Edwin, was once a drug addict who was homeless on the streets. And I don't say this to belittle him. I say this because the man that I knew him to be was a super amazing guy who was super supportive of me. He involved me in his end of life care because uh, he was super proud of me and he also wanted me to accept it because I was probably the one that was pushing back the hardest for him. Um, and so just having all of these challenges in life, having all of these struggles that people in the villages face all the time, um, growing up where uh, people use, who drink really young or smoke or do all these other things, um, and you know, it's just normalized. Uh, but growing up around that made me realize that everyone's human. I'm not gonna look down on someone just because they're struggling in this moment, because everyone has moments in life when they struggle. Um, and at the same time, I've seen how people can turn their lives around. I say this as my last admission to the hospital before being able to jump on a plane and escape cardiology. I'm cr currently on cardiology critical care unit for a rotation um, and trying to learn how to master cardiology as an emergency medicine doctor. Um, but my last patient that I admitted was Alaska Native, which is also very amazing. And it's why I chose the University of Washington for residency. We get uh, Alaska Native patients pretty regularly. Um, so. You know, having these challenges in life helps you see that, um, helps you succeed when your path is not straight and easy, and it shouldn't be straight and easy because I think struggling helps you grow as a person. Uh, and you don't have to be perfect. I'm still growing as a resident and as a doctor. Um, one of my last medical ICU admits at the University of Washington Medical Center um, was a patient who had coded. Coded meaning that they needed CPR. They were an inpatient on a different service. They came to my service and after having received CPR, they got back circulation. This is stuff that emergency medicine doctors do, right? Um, and the patient came to me and as an accepting physician for the ICU service, I had to examine him. And I examined him and I look at him and he has a pretty protuberant belly, uh, meaning that his belly was big. Now, this is a patient who's in liver failure, and that's why he's in the hospital. And so I look at that, and I think, oh, abdominal ascites. That's like a side effect of liver failure, um, where there's a lot of fluid in your belly, and the EDI drain people's bellies quite a bit um, for diagnostic purposes. And so I 
examined it, thought it was ascites, didn't think much of it, proceeded with my exam. And we're still figuring out why did this patient lose his heart rate. Um, so um, the next day, the day team comes on, because I admitted this patient in the middle of the night, maybe like 3 a.m., I don't know. The day team comes on. I'm presenting this patient to the day team because I'm about to go home and sleep. And the attending physician comes up and goes to the patient and is examining him, and he taps on his belly. We have this thing in medicine we call percussion. It's just doing this. We can do this on a person's back. I was going to do it on my son, but he's good. Um, and we can do it on a person's back and hear their lungs and say, hey, do they have fluid in their lungs? Hey, do they have, um, do, do they have a pneumothorax, meaning has one of their lungs collapsed, right? Um, and so it's a skill I learned. And honestly, when I learned it as a medical student, I honestly thought, hey, some foolish doctor back in the day forgot their stethoscope and just started deciding, I'm going to just tap on people's back and make this a thing. <laughs> But it's a super useful skill because this attending physician, obviously more senior than me, I'm not an attending until for three more years, um, he comes in and taps on the patient's belly. And doing that, he says, this is not ascites, this is air. Uh, and then that patient basically got rushed to the CT scanner, got rushed to the OR for surgery. And I, I was just humbled because, and it's not just me, I had an attending physician um, who would check in with me and hear my plan on the patient care because um, as a resident I have my hand held, I'm not expected to know all the things. Um, but it was a very humbling and a very, actually very crucial to know that simple exam skills, something that I thought was like silly because someone probably just forgot their stethoscope, possibly saved that guy's life. Um, so I'm learning as a resident, and those are the little things that I'm learning. Um, all right. Now, uh, I will say I'm super happy in life in the sense that, and I can't say my family is, going to medical school is probably the most selfish thing I've ever done in my life because uh, I knew as a parent that um, I would have to put my kids a little bit on the back burner um, in the sense that, they're, uh, say, October, my son Blaze, who's here with me because I wanted to motivate him to do good in school um, and also to spend time with him. But um, he, the transition from Alaska Native Cultural Charter School in Anchorage to like an outside school system um, was very hard for him. And so when I was on the burn surgery ICU service in October, he struggled in school. And the reason why is because that's a time where I was pulling 80-hour work weeks um, and basically would come home, shower, go to bed, wake up two hours before I want to wake up and go do it all over again and did that like six to eight days a week. Um, and so he struggled more on school on that time. Um, but so, uh, you know, doing, doing all of this, though, it, um, it allows me to kind of push my own boundaries and real what lies what I can do. And you can totally tell I lost the thread of that thought because I got distracted looking at my son. Um, it's okay, doctors do this all the time. Um, but <laughs> um, anyway, um, doing, things, uh, doing things like that and having those challenges throw at me pushes my own boundaries and lets me know what I am capable of. It's like, oh yeah, I can doctor at 27 hours of no sleep. I'm probably a better doctor at like, 18 hours of sleep at least, I mean, of no sleep, than I am at 27 hours. There's actually, uh, this is studied, there's a legal, there's an equivalency to like legally drunk versus how many hours of sleep you do or do not get. It's sad that doctors have to know these things. Um, anyway, um, I will say I'm super happy despite this lack of sleep um, and that I love what I do and I get amazed by some of the things they let me do as a doctor. And I, would, I felt this way even as an EMT in Galena, helping Dr. Huntington, when I'm like asking a patient with a um, dislocated help, hip if she needed help to the bathroom. And, and to me, it would be like an honor because I get to help you and you're letting me help you. And that's how I feel as a doctor every day. It's like, wow, you're letting me do this. You're letting me help you. Um, so I'm very happy where I'm at. I'll say what helped me get here, and because these are potentially keys to success for other people as well, is having, and I was talking to Nicole about this, uh, yep, because um, we grew up together in McGrath and went to uh, elementary and stuff together, um, but we kind of talked about, hey, how did we get to where we're at in life? 
and we kind of both attribute it to our moms. We both have very strong independent role models for mothers. And my mom still, she's crazy. She's like in her 70s working on a PhD in indigenous studies, not her first professional degree, while working at the weather station part time, volunteering as a substitute teacher, raising my step, uh, my um, adopted brother, and then also she's like currently taking care of my nephews. So, you know, having someone like that as a role model definitely helps me in life. Um, having my brothers um, and growing up alongside them because they were so competitive that they put a competitive drive in me. But I've also learned throughout this whole process that I'm never going to be the best at anything. And I don't care. Like, I had to learn to accept that. Probably about the time of, uh, I think I went to Rampart maybe when I was 13. Um, came back after a summer in Rampart, and my brother Arnold, who used to be a slower skier than me and a slower runner than me and shorter than me, was suddenly like, I keep picking on Arnold. I have other brothers, I swear. But he was like suddenly that much taller than me, suddenly kicking my butt on skiing and running, and it was a hard hum uh, pill to swallow. Um, but I've learned to accept it that I'm not the smartest person out there. I've met so many smarter people. I'm not the stupidest person out there. I'm not the best. I'm not the worst, right? And this is it for everyone in life. Um, and also kind of like looking at people's challenges in the moment where someone might be at their lowest point in life, but you know, that could be you tomorrow. I'm not wishing it on anyone, but just kind of that acceptance of this is life. And uh, I think one of the biggest skills in life is learning how to pick yourself up when you fall down. Um, and I learned that as a ski racer when I used to be the WISA State Ski Championship, so the small school state ski championship for the state of Alaska. Um, because once I crashed in a race, and I crashed almost every race, my coach never knew. But once I crashed in a race, I would relax. Because I'm like, whew, I already blew it. Now I can just ski. Um, so, you know, accept your mistakes. Um, overcome your own mental barriers, because much of what holds people back in life is them thinking that they have barriers. Well, I don't have, I, I've definitely had people who are currently in college say, well, I don't have money to do what I want to do, like pursue medicine, pursue whatever. Uh, well, you know, I turned down a teaching contract for more money than I make now as a resident doctor where I work like three times hours. Um, because you don't really get paid as a doctor until you're in attending or moonlighting. I get to moonlight next year. I'm so excited. Moonlighting means I pick up extra shifts um, than when I'm scheduled. Um, anyway, um, so like I, I went from getting paid more, having a mortgage that was one third of my current mortgage, um, and, but not being happy to now I'm like a broke resident. That's kind of a known thing, but I have kids. Most residents don't have kids. Um, and like loving life, like who cares? There's always someone richer me, than me. There's always someone with less money than me. I'm just gonna accept where I'm at. Um, and then also surrounding yourself with good people. I'm super happy to be here. Do you know that I spent the last five years barely surrounded by another Native person? Like, I was the only Native person in my class of 20 for the University of Washington School of Medicine. There was one Native in the class above me, Nikki Jordan. She's from Copper Center. Um, and there's one Native in the class below me, Tyler Samsey. He's uh, not Alaska Native. He's, like, from the other states. Um, I, I can't re remember how to pronounce the type of Native he is, I'll admit. It's, it's not, like, common. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, just kind of come breaking your own barriers and choosing your own path and not, not thinking that you can't do something because the sky is really the limit and you just have to set your mind to it and then take the steps, right? There was no one telling me how to become a doctor. I just, like, well, kind of. I was listening to a podcast, but I had to find the podcast. Um, and then, you know, uh, I already talked about, like, you fall down, get back up. Life's going to throw challenges at you. Don't let it hold you down. Um, and then, so lastly, I swear I'm going to stop talking. I get it from my mom. She talks a lot. Um, <laughs> how can we help others succeed? Because we want to celebrate the success, and everyone in here has achieved some success, but how can we ensure that we're going to keep growing and becoming better as a people, right? Because that's really what we, where we need to go as a people. Um, so I think the first step that we can all do is believe in others. Believe in their capabilities. Um, I remember a couple people in my life, and it's unfortunate to them that I have such a good memory, um, but I remember the people who were discouraging to me, very specifically, I, would call their, I, could, I could call it their names, um, even with my fifth grade teacher in McGrath, um, but I won't. Um, but, you know, just, just thinking about some random comment that you might make to a kid, and he might seem like a little punk kid, <clears throat> like my son, <clears throat> um, who, who literally was failing um, Washington history. 
who cares about Washington history? Anyway, people have to take Alaska history when they come to Alaska. But he was failing Washington history um, just this week, earlier this week, and then they said, hey, you have to pass this to move on to the next grade. And then he takes an exam like the next day and gets an A. And I'm like, you little punk. <laughs> you obviously can do this work. Um, but you know, someone sees someone like that. Oh, here's a student who's failing at all these things. He's super wiggly. He's super mischief. Um, you know, and they might say some discouraging comment. You're never going to do anything in life, type of deal. But honestly, how do you know, right? No one's perfect. Everyone has stumbling blocks. Everyone struggles in life a little bit. Um, so just believe in people. Don't look at someone saying, "Oh man, they've been drinking for the past month. They're never going to achieve anything in life. Why are they here?" Because they're people, and you don't know. They might be the next president. Um, the next thing is to lend your shoulder, to lift people up around you. Uh, and so I, I'm going to give a little kudos to Doyon for doing this. Um, because Doyon uh, helped establish the Doyon Foundation, right? Uh, and that's literally the purpose of that whole foundation, is to help people achieve their educational goals and dreams. And I will say, much like Aaron over here, that I had Doyon support, um, Doyon Foundation support through all of this educational process. And so they, they were holding my hand a lot, right? Because I went through undergrad, I went through two postgraduate programs, um, my teacher licensure year, as well as a postgraduate certificate in uh, kindergarten through eighth grade math education, and then my master's degree, and then medical school. So. Thank you to Doyon for that. Super awesome. Um, and I'd say the next thing um, to help people be successful is to help find mentors for people and help be, be a mentor. I've done this throughout medical school. I still do it. I will say, I woke up this morning, checked my email, had an email from my friend Alex McLarian, who is a fourth year medical student at the University of North Dakota. She is uh, Chupik um, and was raised in Anchorage. Um, and I helped get her into the University of North Dakota through the application process. She just messaged me to say, hey, I matched with the Alaska Family Medicine Residency Program. So that's awesome. Um, not everyone who applies to residency as a doctor matches. It's crazy, right? You already have to go through this humbling experience in medical school. Then you have to try to get into residency. Um, and so, you know, I helped her with the process. Um, I helped others with the process. Some are current medical students. Some are still applying. Offer yourself as a mentor. All of you have been successful in some way. Um, and I didn't have a ton of doctor support going through this process, but I had my mom, I had my brothers, I had my friends. When I um, applied to medical school and told people I was doing this, because I was kind of in the process of applying already when I told people, my stepmom, who's also in the crowd over there, she's uh, was a public health nurse, she told me, oh, it's about time. I'm like, what? <laughs> I, was, I was over here teaching. What do you mean it's about time I become a doctor? Um, and then one of the other things I would uh, like to uh, push forward is just to celebrate success. And it's happening now, right? You guys invited me as a keynote speaker, which thank you for that. I hope I didn't totally bore your ear, and hopefully not too many people are sleeping. Oh. As a side note, because I go on tangents quite a bit, um, I learned as a medical student and a resident that you can sleep standing up. Anyway, <laughs> super cool skill. Uh, maybe not when I'm in the middle of cardiology rounds. Um, but celebrating success, because in celebrating it, not only are we honoring the people who have been successful, but we're also normalizing success. I want us all to be successful. Um, so I was in this. Uh, Emergency medicine conference, we have them every Thursday for emergency medicine residency. It's like five hours of lectures and training. But I was in a communication workshop yesterday, and one of my um, doctor's mentors, she's not from the US originally, so we kind of share that we're from other an outside culture coming into this system. Um, she said, and I wrote this quote down because I thought it was awesome, you want to bring out the best in everyone around you. And that's totally how I think we as a people can achieve success, working on bringing out the best in everyone around us. Um, <laughs> So I stand here humbly before you today as a doctor um, pursuing emergency medicine. So I mean, they let me do some pretty crazy things. I love it. Um, but just remember that it wasn't an easy and simple path for me, um, that I once set my little brother's diaper on fire. Um, <laughs> I had to explain why I had a minor consuming alcohol when I was applying to residency. Um, so 
also blaming my brothers because Archie was literally, it was the very first time I ever drank alcohol. I was in Canada from Galena on spring break. My brother Archie was sitting there on his snow machine like probably 50 feet away laughing at me as a cop put me in his car. Anyway, I had to explain this when I was applying to medical school and also for my medical license. They still accepted me. So you're going to fall down, uh, people stumble, you can just get back up. Um, so. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for listening to me. Uh, I know I talk fast and I talk a lot. So, but uh, thank you for giving me a break from cardiology. Anabasi. Wow, what a story. Let's give her another round of applause. And oh, this applause was for you to was for you learning how to sleep standing up. <laughs> <laughs> and we are all very proud of you. You make you give us hope, people like you. So Bessie. So, Dr. Weeder, please accept this beaded sun catcher by Ethel Sekalaskas.